Welcome back to Radio Juxtapose, my name is Doug Gillen. On today's episode, both Evan Preco and myself sit down with Austrian conceptual artist and sculptor Erwin Worm. For over four decades, Erwin Worm has been challenging the idea of what constitutes a sculpture. Exploring the relationship between the audience and objects, he reimagines the banality of everyday life. Since the 1980s, his One Minute Sculpture series has broken the invisible fourth wall that exists between art and the audience, inviting spectators to interact with a variety of objects becoming sculptures themselves. As we place our head or limbs through tactically placed holes in the walls of a caravan or stepping through the legs of a chair, our bodies create unique shapes, disrupting the way we perceive these structures and the functions they supposedly provide. Erwin's work takes many different forms, including large-scale installations and often moving sculptures. His fat cars and houses transform these objects into cartoonish versions of their former selves with accentuated curves and bloated contours. As he talks to us today from Austria, a few thousand miles away in Savannah, Georgia, the doors open to his latest exhibition, Hot, at the SCAD Museum. An exploration further into his practice largely through the lens of his interest in fashion and the changing relationships we have with our bodies. Throughout today's conversation, we talk about adjusting to societal changes and attitudes, the role of humour in institutional art, and a lot more. If this is your first time joining us here, please do subscribe to the podcast and let us know wherever you happen to be listening in from. Let's get into it right here, right now, with Erwin Worm on Radio Juxtapose. Congratulations on the show at SCADMOA and apologies that you couldn't be there for the opening. How do you feel having a museum show across the world that you haven't quite seen yet, but you will see at some point? I know I, it feels bad, but in, you know, in, in the summer I, I couldn't travel. And then when I was supposed to fly over, I got sick and now I'm again sick. So I, it sounded for me a little bit like a, a Oh, it maybe it sounded for you that I would like to escape this, but I'm not. <laughs> so for that reason, I am not totally okay today, but I had to do it. Otherwise, you know, you, you would get wrong, wrong impressions. So can you maybe, for the purposes of the, the podcast, can you maybe tell us about how you kind of conceptualize the show and what it is? Uh, as, it, it's, um, as they're dealing with fashion a lot, so we, we took the body of work which is related to this um, issue. And, uh, you know, basically I was trained as a sculptor, means uh, three-dimensional classical sculptures. And now some people understand something else about it. Also me, I, I developed my idea about sculpture. But at that time, it was basically, I started to make um, research on a sculpture. What is it? What does it mean? From two to three dimension, the skin, surface, mass, volume, time is also included. So there are different aspects. When we speak about sculpture and skin, then I have to remind people on Roman or Greek old traditional sculptures casted in bronze. There you we could see or we can see horses made in bronze or athletes or big guys. Um, and uh, they show very massive bodies and uh, massive sculptures. But these sculptures, these bodies are only defined by a very thin layer of skin. It's the bronze skin. It was in the old times only three millimeters thick. And here we are, the, the skin describes the body and produces the idea of mass and volume in us. Then I thought when, when I came to um, the skin I was dealing with, I started to speak about uh, clothes. So we wear a sweater, a jumper or a jacket or whatever. So it's in a way the second skin of us. It's two dimensional, of course. So I started to deal with this. It's we can hide in it. It's we can um, uh, express ourselves. It can get a massive sculptural attitude and issue. And so here we go from close it's just a short step in a really direct way and i think you have just started to address this but i just want to ask it directly for you what's a sculpture a sculpture i would say now is uh, or for me from my understanding when i'm dealing with the one minute sculptures one minute sculpture is um it's a short or cut out of a daily life um, experience between a person and an object in the context of this show, you're showing fashion, but you're also showing the one-minute sculptures. And 
are you trying to make sure that people sort of understand their relationship to fashion, to art, to surfaces a lot more like in an interactive way than they would normally going into a museum? From an artistic point of view, I don't care about fashion. When I love many fashion designers, they're great, great artists, but I don't care, for, uh, I don't care about it. Um, I care more about the clothes and the aspect that we can we dress up, we can invent ourselves new all the time. We can um, definite our body, our personality, our experience. And that's very much interesting uh, f- to me. I came to the fashion, by the way, when I started the One Minute Sculptures, I got many calls and invitations from photographers, fashion photographers, advertisement photographers, and others. And they would always say, um, you know, um, we like your ideas very much. And maybe we could do something together. But um, at that time, I didn't want to make this collaboration. So I started to, I wanted to, uh, to develop my own work. And then I've realized all of a sudden I saw advertisements, um, for example, Gap. Uh, made once an advertisement and I was not sure is it my work or not it looked so familiar <laughs> or others started to do this so I you know I could have given up and let the others do my work but in a in a way I wanted to keep it as my work so I started to fight for it and I started to go forward and make um, one minute sculptures short living sculptures in fashion magazines, in art magazines, in magazines all over the world. And luckily enough, I got many invitations. So I started to do this. They, this, you know, this connected me in a way to the fashion world. Also, I was not really interested in the fashion. Again, I love fashion, but still, you understand my different approach. Mm. Uh, yeah. approach. When, when like Hermes comes to you and wants to do a project with you, do you say like, look, just give me the stuff. I'm going to do what I want to do. Or are they kind of like, so uh, Mr. Worm, we have an idea. Are, are you pretty much kind of working uh, in isolation from the fashion house when you do something? It depends uh, on the fashion house and on the people I'm dealing with. Um, uh, Hermes was great. I had totally freedom what I wanted to do. And my condition was they were not allowed to make an advertisement out of it. So I wanted to follow my work and my ideas of sculptures, one minute sculptures. And I would do it for them, but they were not allowed to use it as an advertisement. So it's a bit tricky, you know, with big fashion brands and with the fashion industry. Of course, they live from advertisement and all this, but I, I tried to, in a way, ship around this. So they were allowed to show the pieces in their stores. They have exhibition places all over the world. We showed them there. But again, they never made a single advertisement out of it. The world of advertising, fashion, corporates, was there a reluctance to engage with this world in the way that you have? Or was it something that you just thought, I kind of, I have to do this, or they're just going to keep taking my ideas and and I'm never going to get credited for it? I think this was the most important point. Remember Brancusi's fantastic work of the bird of the what is what is it's a what is it called in English? It's a, the bird is standing on long legs and has a long uh, a heron heron story. Yeah, yeah. You know he made this wonderful stork heron, stork. and it was copied so many times, and in a way, it became artistically cheap because so many people misused his work. And then at the end, you could not look at the original piece anymore, not having this uh, history of all this bad stuff, what is going on around it. So mm. I wanted to be, um, I was very aware of this and I wanted to be careful with my work. So for that reason, I, I, I was strict. And also with the one minute captures, you know, I do them now since a long time. And um, I never accepted an, an invitation for a party or for a concert or I thought that just for fun. I got many, many invitations, but I never, I never, I always said no. I only accepted invitations to perform one minute sculptures in museum context, in a very serious context. Otherwise, you know, they are close to the clamauk and fun and choke and ridiculousness. And I would have lost them very easily. Is this how you protected your ideas then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. And then, you know, p- people like Greta Chili Peppers came, which was mm. fantastic. Mm. It was Mark, Mark Romanek. Um, this is a big turning point for you, wasn't it? Yes. And man, Mark was very famous. 
And he made all the videos with the big pop groups at that time. It was, I think, Michael Jackson, the Rolling Stones. I don't know who has really big names. And then all of a sudden they asked me. I wasn't, in, I wasn't invited to make the video with them, but to allow them to use my one minute sculptures. And then they made the video Can't Stop. I got paid well. But which was much more interesting was the fact that I wanted to be credited. And they did it. And, you know. I don't know if you remember on, on, on MTV and, and at that time, it, we're speaking about 20 years ago, that there were so many ideas of all these artists just stolen and copied and mm -hmm. nobody got credited. And I think maybe I was, I think I was the first artist who got credited on MTV. This was quite something I must say. At, at this point, when, when you were doing that project, you had already done the fat car sculptures. You had done the hot dog bus. Had that work already been created? No, no, no. The one minute sculptures were done. The original one minute sculptures were done 1997. It's when I gave them the name one minute sculptures. I was always working on the idea of, as I told you, sculptural uh, research. When I stand straight or you stand straight or whatever, still in the place, it's an action. But can this also be transferred into a sculpture? Uh, what do I have to do to make this happen? So I, I made many tries and errors and made videos and photos and all of this. So I made, I created many short living sculptures. For example, I made a series with sweaters, You could take them, basically, you could wear the sweater, then you could take it off um, and follow my instructions and put the sweater by following my instructions with two nails on the wall and, and it would be transferred into a strange object. And then after the show, whether it was two weeks or two months, you could take it down the, from the nails from the wall and could wear it again as a sweater. So this short living aspect of sculpture, I was very into it and I liked it very much. On the way of this trip and of this research, I started to make this so-called one-minute sculptures. But I gave the name one-minute sculptures only in 1997, I remember. For you, if you had to, and I know as an artist, I think you're probably more inclined to ask questions than to answer them. 20 years of, of these, you know, really ephemeral ideas for you as an artist, ultimately, what is it that you're trying to look for? Well, you know, I'm, I'm asking our time about the absurd and the paradox. I'm very much interested in this. I mean, look at our world, how fucked up our world is. One has to be very, crea very creative to reach this level of absurdity and, uh, and craziness in, in reality so, or in the artwork. So um, as I was influenced a lot or interested a lot by the absurd theater, jean or UNESCO or Samuel Beckett or also the Austrian second generation uh, writer, uh, absurd writer, Thomas Bernhardt, um, um, I love this attitude on looking on something um, strange and weird from our society and from our world, because I thought then maybe we see clearer or we see other things. We see reali our reality different and we can ask different questions and maybe we see things clearer. I don't know. So it, it was, a, you know, it was an experiment with our reality or it is still an experiment with our reality. But no, you no, you no, asked no, me the no. question, the one minute sculpture is just one part because As you know, maybe I made the, the fat objects and I made many, many other things which are basically dealing with the same ideas. But here I have to say something because fat, nowadays you cannot use the word fat anymore. Hmm? And I understand totally. But this did not came from obesity or from the idea that a, a person eats so much that it gets big and, and you know, and overweight. It was more in, in Austria where I grew up My father was a policeman, a detective. We didn't have much money. We were kind of poor. And of course, as boys, we loved the guys with the big cars. And we called them fat cars, fat auto, because it's, it were the cars from the rich guys. So mm -hmm. this term fat meant <clears throat> rich and important and big and showing off. So I used it in this way. And, and there's now there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. But that's the yeah. origin. I like the idea of the fact that 
you have these things called the one minute sculpture, which also changes the viewer's perception of what time goes into making art and the idea of space and time. And then also you make these grandiose sculptures that take up a lot of space that seem like they take a lot of time. Do you feel like you're, you're taking the viewer on a little bit of an adventure in terms of what it is that time means when it comes to art, which I guess goes into the absurd thing too. Yeah, I, I hope so. But you know, when we all, um, when you go to Italy, I recently was in Florence and I went to the Ephesus and to all these other uh, uh, fantastic museums. I saw Donatella and I saw Michelangelo again. When you're standing in front of one of these sculptures, you have to walk around to understand it. You cannot look from one angle like in front of a painting. You have to do something. You have to move. And this costs time. That's an important interaction with the piece to understand the piece. And I thought, why not? switching it around so why not making the spectator the audience to the sculpture and let him transfer from an object uh, from a, a subject into an object and you know this was all these things which are happening uh, when people are doing this it's very exciting and interesting but one really has to do it to realize what is happening what is going on when you do it when you're there on the stage and do these things do you ever think about what Michelangelo would have thought of a one-minute sculpture? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, I'm too humble. To such, a, such a direct <laughs> answer to that. No, I'm, I'm not playing these games. You know, I'm uh, no. okay. Let's 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 go let's go simpler. What would a 20-year-old Erwin Worm think about the one-minute sculptures? Like, what about like what about your kind of young stages of becoming an artist? You mentioned your dad being a detective growing up in Austria. Like, what? What would you have thought about your one minute sculptures? Like, let's say, you know, when you were a young man. Yeah, well, um, actually, as I am was interested in all this crazy stuff, I probably would have been surprised what came out of my head. <laughs> because I remember very well when I told my father I would like to become an artist. You know, the doors were smashed and he was screaming and we had fights. And you know how it is. He was a policeman and he had the idea of an artist being already with one leg in the criminal. So it was very suspicious to him and to my entire family. The, the, so they hated this idea. But at the end, you know, you have to be stubborn enough and, and to do things. It was also interesting because I started, I think when I was like my, I have a, I have a little daughter now. She's wonderful. She's thir turning 13 soon and she's reading. And when I, I started to read at that time, I got a little pocket money from my father and went every week to the city and or the pocket book, you know, these paperback books. I don't know why. One of my first books was uh, from Gerold Brecht, uh, Gerold Brecht, Gerold Brecht, you know, the famous Brecht, uh, the, the very left writer, uh, Bert Brecht, Bert Brecht, it's his name. Caesar, he, he wrote a book, Caesar. I don't know why I bought this, maybe because the cover was so nice. Actually, this was my first book. <laughs> And then I started to read um, a lot and every week. And later on, I started to read about art. And this was when I opened this door into my private world, into my private secret world, because my parents didn't follow me. And this was my secret space when I left. And also art became a secret space. And later on, when I made the first shows, I didn't like to invite my parents for this. I was embarrassed in front of them. So this was my secret space. And it still is. Wait, I think it's quite astute to mention the fact that Brecht would be something that you would have picked up and read considering what you do now, since Brecht was so much about performance and, uh, and the, the arts. But this was a pure coincidence. Okay. I think so, yeah. Okay. When I started to read, uh, for example, from Beckett Molloy, you know, the, Molloy is this book where, where there's a guy who always has these coins in his trousers and he started to play with this. This was more influential to me, but Brecht okay. not. Okay. You know. What did art offer you at this point? You know, you say it was your little safe sort of secret space, but what was it that it was giving you during these early moments of safety? You know, when you, when you grow up in a, in a certain society, we were speaking, I was born 54. So I was talking about the early 60s and Austria, but Austria, no, Austria never had the, the revolution of 68. <laughs> yes, there were guys with long hair and me too, and we like pop music and all this. But uh, the Austrian society was much slower. It was still in the end of the six, uh, end of the fifties until the middle sixties. It was still a post-war society. Many old Nazis were hidden in somewhere in the government and at the school. And, and it was a strict society. So, we, for example, we got beaten up by our teachers. It, 
yeah, today it's impossible. But yeah, I got slapped and beaten by by a teacher. This was normal. At that time, when I was young, when I was a boy, I didn't think that this is wrong. It was just a reality. Later on, you know, by reflecting about the time and reading and seeing other cultures and seeing other countries, I realized, well, something was wrong there. But during the time, it was not. And for example, we body shamed basically every everybody and everybody shamed everybody body shamed it was the mm. fat guys and the slim guys and the whatever the one who had a how do you, who were not straight and then with the freckles and all this so it was a, an, an intense um, aggression in the society against people who were different against people who were different and and so my space I was in peace in my space because nobody spoke artists, you know, I remember uh, girls when I was, I don't know, when I was mid twenties, I remember girls telling them I becoming an artist and they were like, no, 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 we cannot accept this. You would be a good looking dentist, but not a, never an artist. So it was like an insult. That's how I grew up. I was basically, I felt always insulted by the society because nobody liked it. It was more or less, you would say you're insane. Huh? So how quickly did it start to become, did the realization hit you that this was actually going to be your life's work? I don't know. Um, maybe, it's, it, uh, maybe it also has to do with the history of, of Austria. You know, Austria was for 700 years ruled by the Habsburgians. It was a monarchy. And then there were basically two, more or less 2,000 years Catholic Church. And then between those two blocks, the Austrian solo character or whatever you might call it developed. So people got all a bit strange in a way. And then at the end, when everything collapsed, um, don't forget we had very, we had very famous and fantastic Jewish scientists. We had uh, Schrödinger, and we had Wittgenstein, the philosopher, and we had Sigmund Freud, uh, who invented the uh, psychoanalysis in Vienna. So, and in Austria we had the Baroque, the Baroque, the you know the the the. Mm -hmm. the um, Mm -hmm. the, the buildings, everything, which was done to represent heaven on earth because they were fighting against the Protestants and against the, against the Turks. So the Catholic Church needed this to show heaven on earth exists and it's here. And then later on, it was the expressionism, which was very big in Austria. Then there were Adolf Reiner, Franz West, um, all the writers, Chile. So it was it it made sense in a way when 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 you see it from nowadays and the history. So the history of a country always reflects uh, into the arts. When we go back to the music world, Austria is, was very big in music, in classical music. Right. The most famous composers were in Austria because. Uh, Leopold II, who was the emperor at that time, was a huge entrepreneur, uh, who was a huge, how do you call it, a connoisseur in, in music. Connoisseur, tomb, and mastership goes together. The ones who love art, support art, and support artists, and artists get better because they feel supported and they feel, and, and they feel challenged. And this worked mm -hmm. extremely well in the art, uh, in, in, in the music world in Austria. I don't know why I will say this now. I forgot. I like the journey. I liked it. It was amazing. Well, because it, it works really well in the context that, you know, Austria has a rich art history. But what was the contempor Austrian contemporary art world you were walking into in the 1970s? Like, what did that look like? Remember, Viennese actionists. The crazy yeah. guys, Nietzsche, uh -huh. Otto Müll, yeah. uh, Günther Bruce, you know, they were rebellious against uh, the church, against the state, against the society, because it was a post-war society and still very narrow-minded and very um, rigid and things like that. On the one side, on the other side, we had the Viennese surrealists, the Viennese, uh, what is it called, the Viennese school, they were second, second uh, generation surrealists. But both were dealing with the same issues of a society which is got stuck and which is um, strange and which has to be renewed, kicked out of, of history and brought into uh, 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 reality. But uh, wh when it comes to the um, Viennese actionists, from my understanding, and also the and, and also the surrealists, they were too dramatic for me. It was very much about the pathos and uh, that dramatic gesture. I was another. I'm another person. I was very much much more interested in the marginal, in the not so big questions and issues. You know, I, I, I quite often said I'm I'm not asking questions. Where do we come from and where do we go? I ask questions, what do I wear tomorrow and what do I eat? I think this is more related to our daily life and to what's really important to us. 
Do you think that will ever change? Do you think maybe as you start to, and I don't want this to be taken the wrong way, but as you start to get you know further or closer to to the end, do you ever think? I think it's natural for. Do you think it's it's natural for humans to do that? Right? We all start to think about the. Our, we all question our mortality. This is the end, and my friend. Yes. Do you? I'm skirting a line here. Do you ever? Do you ever think that you might start to look to these big grand questions the way that art has over the years? Yes, I'm. I'm still doing this, and I'm. I'm more and more concerned because I grew up with art. 70s, 60s, 70s, asking these questions. But many of these artists were working with a pathos, with a with an importance and a, a strong attitude. I'm not I'm not uh, giving you names now because I don't want to make enemies. So they had this <laughs> huge entrance, and pathos was everywhere. Uh, I think pathos makes the people small because they are impressed and uh, shy in front of it, it. And yeah, it makes them small. I like more the idea of make them levitate through play and game and seduce them into something what they might love about. But then on the second thought, they think about themselves and uh, think about how life is going on. And I have a different aspect to life. You're listening to Urban Worm here on Radio Juxtapose. We've talked a little bit about humour in your work, and I think about humour in art just in general, you know, whether it's films or in, you know, paintings or whatever, it seems to be always looked down upon. And I wonder I wonder how your relationship is with humour as an artist, and if that has changed over the years as you've started to become, I guess, more accepted or accredited within these institutional worlds. This is, I think, from my understandings, uh, understanding still related to the Frankfurt the Schule, Adorno and all these guys, they were so dry, serious. Uh, they were not able to look from a different angle into our world. And I see this in our society growing, intensively growing. And it scares me. This um, attitude of everything is so serious and I have to be taken so serious. Otherwise, I kill myself or I kill you or whatever. This is really a danger, I, I see. But maybe I'm old fashioned. I think it's a big threat. It would be nice to be able to look onto our reality, on our personality from a different angle and to make it more, how, how do you call this? Um, uh, I forgot now the right word in English, maybe it comes back later. I was wondering if you had to learn or if it was a, something that's taken years to, to create work that um, was humorous and was funny, but what kind of was didn't have to have a particular language behind it. Uh, just like language barriers in art when it comes to humor. Or just cultural yes. barriers. Yes, and I've realized when you do something what people love about, they don't take it serious. So you have to be very careful to to work with this tool. And then on the second uh, idea or the second thoughts are many people who work with humor miss reality because they exaggerate or um, they're not refined enough. So it has to be a, a, a certain level. Uh, it has to have a certain quality. And humor, by the way, is never enough. It has to, how can I say, because everybody understands uh, uh, something very different with you when it comes to humor some people are shocked some people are are don't like it at all are not pleased at all and some people laugh about things so you never know what you're dealing with so humor is not a good aspect to start with i like to ask questions on our reality and i try to make the step on the side and to look onto the same problem from another side. And then maybe I see something else, probably because I'm Austrian and the Austrian are quite cynical. Maybe it has to do with my genes, who knows? <laughs> I, you know, every, we all get fed in our societies, in our country sp specific food. Maybe I ate something, but made me like that, who knows? <laughs> Erwin, I, I was kind of curious, like what, um, kind of what, I know you're, you're home ill at the moment, but what is the kind of, uh, the weekly life uh, in your studio? It's very normal. It's very boring because I get up in uh, every morning and three times a week, I, I have a trainer coming work out to work out, you know, because I would like to get 100 one day, uh, to turn 100 one day. So I'm really working. I try to eat okay. healthy. I stop drinking. I stop smoking. I don't take drugs. I have really a boring life, but I like it. How long have you been doing that? How long have you been doing the trainer, no drinking, no smoking? Uh, since 10 years, the trainer, okay. the no drinking just 
in, because in the summer we always in Greece we have a house there you're pulled into alcohol yeah. so I try to save myself and to get out of this and I, I just stopped drinking for two months but it, I don't miss it at all but I don't smoke since 20 years and um, okay. I try to live a healthy life I have three children and uh, I like to be uh, it's not an artist life anymore, I must say. I'm not a bohemian anymore, by far not. So I have a very organized life and I have my employee, uh, my employees and my assistants are coming and everything is very, very settled and very great. Do you value value time differently now as you get older when you are in the studio? Like, Is it, is it a different value system for yourself than it was when you were maybe a young man starting out? You know, when, you, when you're when you into the art world and um, you're a bit successive, uh, successful, then all of a sudden you have galleries, you work with galleries, then you have to produce for galleries, for you produce for uh, art fairs and for these shows and that shows. Then all of a sudden you're in this one of these hamster wheels mm -hmm. and it's not so pleasant so i always had to try to correct and to go back with something ringing here I, I i really think you know i'm now next year i turn 70 my god so how much time do i have yes i know it, it's ridiculous but you know everybody who is aging started to ask these stupid questions is it a quality uh, how much quality time do i still have and can i continue I my work and can I see my kid growing older? And am I allowed to have this and to have that? So that's a big, yeah, that's true. It's a question. I'm still reading and I have, we have no TV at home. And, and no, and so my, my, my daughter is growing up without any TV. Erwin, something that's also kind of fascinating to talk about somebody who, you know, you've, the art world is on a, a completely different speed than it used to be. Yeah. How do you not get sucked into that? Teach these young artists what should they not do? Well, that's that's a, that's a good question because everybody says at the beginning you should not make shows for several years since you you should create a great body of work. But on the other side, when you make shows and make bad shows, you learn a lot. You learn with pain. It's painful and hurtful but you learn a lot when you never dare to show and when you're not confronted with bad critics then you don't learn this and critics critic is an important part in developing an artwork because we can learn from it if it's not you know if not people just want to make you down because they hate you for but a good critic it's always there i think it's very very important it supported me always have you noticed critics opinions and writings of you change over the years as maybe your work has started to become a little bit less left field and a little bit more normalized it is it was always very important for me yes and you know you a, a critic he can basically kill you and so it's also frightening in a way and uh you get used to this after the after the years and it's not so dramatic anymore but it's still it's a reality where we all have to deal with how do we how uh, do we want to be seen by the others and how do the others see sees us and, and this is very much related to the work because as an artist and as a writer or a musician or whatever the work is us so if somebody if somebody's a doctor he can say he's a he's a bad doctor but he's still a great guy as an artist when somebody says you're a bad artist you're dead because you are the person you are you're connected in a way so it's much more i don't know it's it's uh much more hurtful do you find it uh, uh, that different, you know, here here we are, we're speaking because you have a solo museum show in the, you know, American South, you you live in Vienna, or you live outside of Vienna, you're, you're, you're shown in different, obviously different countries, different galleries, different, you know, different parts of the world. Is there a harsher critic that comes from Central Europe as opposed to America, or is America really critical? Like, what 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 cultures tend to be the most critical of your work or of, or of any work you know? The most critical surroundings I think is almost the home country. It's almost the home city, actually. Yeah, because they hate you <laughs> when you when you when you're successful. They hate you, of course, and so they have to make you down. And but that's normal. That's a normal attitude, and I understand it. But I think this is for every artist the same. I feel more understood and accepted in other countries or cities or states than in Austria. I never understand how that works, but it always is the case. Every artist says, like, my home city just does not like yeah. me. <laughs> because I can tell you, I was teaching at the art university here in Vienna for nine years. 
then I gave up. I, I, uh, I don't want to go on with this. I met great, great young artists, great people, but they all had the same problem. If one of them had one show more than the others, they started to hate him because it's about equality. They all want to be, you know, equal. And if mm-hmm. one pops up, then they start to hate him because why he and not me or why she and not me. I think that's uh, in our genes or whatever. One of the things that I was, you know, always been fascinated because I've just loved your work for years and years, but who, who do you, who do you consider your contemporaries? Like who, who is playing in the world that you think that you're playing in? Or do you, do you kind of find yourself alone on a, a Viennese Island? I had friends here. Franz West was um, one I liked very much. And Hans Weigand is an artist not many people know. He's a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine. He's a great, brilliant act, um, artist, but nobody, he doesn't have success. I'm friends with, with, with artists, with a lot of artists, with writers and also with musicians, with filmmakers, with actresses. Uh, um, Julian Anderson was here two days ago and it was fantastic. We had a wow. great photo. She didn't allow me to post the photo. <laughs> I think that's the best name drop we've had on this that podcast. That was a great, <laughs> great name drop. <laughs> Yeah, my God, you ask me, yeah? So no, um, it was it was an invitation. It was an invitation. <laughs> yeah, and and then I have many friends because you know, in in my age, when they when you didn't have a, a kind of a success or career, then it's quite bitter because you not only have no money, you also have no respect in a way. And um, I have several friends like this, and uh, some I support, and yeah. Do you see threads of yourself uh, and your practice in kind of emerging artists in in other ways? Because I know that you reference some kind of more contemporary peers, but I wonder if you see it because I was thinking, and I don't know how much you would be able to relate to this, but I see loads of threads in your work in contemporary street art. And I was wondering if you you agree with that and to what extent? You know, I have no problem with, actually, it's great when, when, when artists use my work as an inspiration or whatever. It's great. What I never liked if advertisement people start to use my, my work and, you know, make big money out of it and ad- advertisements. And this was not nice, but with art, it's wonderful. But uh, what do you wish more? And, and when writers write about you, I think it's great. It's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, just to piggyback on what Doug was saying, and we can we can end here because I know you've, you're not feeling well, and Doug's got a baby in his hand. You know, he he touched on the idea of street art, but just public art in general. Um, that's something that you have have done. You've done public sculpture. How important is getting art out of the walls for you and into a public space? Absolutely, it's fantastic because you know there is this fear of the doorstep how do you call it uh, the schwellenangst we call it in german um, it's the fear of entering a museum or ent- entering a gallery space or even to look at art because it's supposed to be important and most people don't want to deal with this so it's good that the artists came out and all these street art is fantastic well, vienna changed so much because of, because of all of these street artists and uh, i love it and you know for me for myself i thought also i have to move out because of this with the one minute sculptures because the museum context is great and gallery context is great but there is more than this there's more behind this and i think it's necessary to pull it out and to bring much more bring it to the people like music do, does all the time it's fantastic what's your favorite one minute sculpture <laughs> i don't know you have how many kids do you have there's very one human in front of me. This is it. So imagine you have 700 and yeah. I would ask you, which one is your favorite? <laughs> well, some are, let's say some are better. Some are maybe smarter than the other ones. Some are stupid, but I cannot say I have, um, you know, uh, the best one. Do you try to like look at it? I know, I, I know that this is what we do from our position as kind of journalists. We try to, you know, put on theory and attach meaning to these things, but... Are you conscious about attaching meaning to these sculptures as you're making them or when you're installing them? Very much. It's very important. I think content is most important. And I mostly deliver it with titles or I, I make paintings in some years and it's titles what I paint for the content also. And many, I made videos, they were all about content, most important. 
kind of feel like we could have sailed through a few more hours with Erwin on this one, but we do appreciate him being so generous with his time to join us here, and we'll just cross our fingers for a follow-up interview sometime in the future. Hot runs at the SCAD Museum in Georgia until the 15th of January 2024, so you do have a bit of time to catch it if you can. That's it from us here at Radio Juxtapose. As always, we will be back with you all really soon. Till that moment comes, take care of yourselves and each other.